Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar. My name is Camille Dupuis, and I will be moderating. Uh, today, we'll be talking about cyber threat hunting, identify and hunt down intruders. We'll go ahead and meet our guest speaker, Jeremy Martin, in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to go over just a couple things. So as panelists, you are all muted, um, but we invite you to please ask questions at any time. You can do that through the question and answer panel, and we'll pepper those questions in and, and let our expert Jeremy um, share some information about that. In addition, uh, you will receive a recording of this webinar after the presentation is over. Um, if you are looking for CPEs, you may be eligible to earn professional education credits from this webinar. So what you can do is after the presentation is over, you can go ahead and request a certificate of completion that you can submit then to your certifying body. And the link is there on your screen on how to request that certificate. We'll also send that in the email um, after the presentation is over today. And then you'll want to go ahead and check with your certifying body. Each one is a little bit different with what the requirements are for CPEs. Um, and you can check out this article that might help you. Here's the link. And again, you'll receive that as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jeremy. Um, Jeremy Martin is a senior security researcher that has focused, and he has focused on his profession around red team penetration testing, computer forensics, open source intelligence, and cyber warfare. So he started his career in 1995, um, and he has worked with Fortune 200 companies and federal government agencies, receiving a number of awards for his service. Jeremy currently provides training and works with several governmental incident response and computer forensics departments. Outside of consulting, he is an instructor uh, here for InfoSec Institute. He is a security researcher, he's a published author, and he speaks at security conferences around the world. Mr. Martin's current research projects include vulnerability analysis, threat profiling, exploitation automation, anti-forensics, open source intelligence gathering, and reverse engineering malware. Uh, he's also a member of several organizations, um, including the Information Security and Assurance Community um, organizations. He also volunteers for local ISSA and ACFEI chapters. So, Jeremy, great, great person to have with us today. We want to thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to kind of get us started on what Blue Team is and, and really what we're going to be talking about today. Good morning. So, yeah, going back to basically Blue Team. Um, so, of course, she mentioned a little bit about Red Team, the attackers. Blue Team primarily is let's be trying to find threats. So with the blue team, it does require quite a few different subject matter expert types. Uh, so it, I, I know there's a term out there, jack of many trades. Um, it, it is a good idea to try to be that yourself as well. Uh, definitely know some of the basics on networking. Uh, and I know that uh, things like uh, deep learning, machine learning is uh, starting to become a big hit here too, which does help uh, with the analyzation of data. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, primary issue here is trying to find the bad guys. And that does get a little bit more challenging, especially if they're more advanced. So again, that's where, especially if you can um, even bring things like a uh, torch and TensorFlow, those are AI uh, items into the mix that can help find things that uh, people may be missing. But yes, um, with that being said, the, I guess, biggest thing that, uh, especially with the threat hunting community, is risk management. So I know here they're talking about uh, shift in mindset. Y y there's always going to be residual risk. It all comes down to trying to find that uh, special points to where risk is acceptable level. So there's a lot of issues out there over the years that uh, people would think that they're 100% secure or they're air gapped. And a lot of times they may be. Majority of times, they're not. Um, I've seen so many scenarios. For example, there's sites out there like Shodan. Shodan's a great uh, um, demonstration of people that think they're air-gapped and they're not. So going back to here, uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that get found, and the vendors don't get notified right away. And the people that are compromised, they don't know it until – there's kind of a running joke in uh, the investigation uh, community is that the bad guy has to be lucky every single time. 
You just have to be lucky once. And so even though it's almost a year um, to identify a breach, it, it's just that one key indicator or indicator of compromise that uh, one of the analysts might see. What's this? They investigate a little bit further and then identify what the potential issue is. There's uh, one project that I was working on. This is a, a while ago. And unfortunately, the organization we worked with did not either have the funding or they didn't uh, understand the potential benefit of it. But uh, we did what we called the scanner darkly. And uh, a colleague of mine basically took a bunch of net flow data and did historical analysis over a year period of time. And he was great. He was basically a brilliant uh, programmer as well, uh, network engineer. And he wrote this application to look at all the traffic. And what we're looking for was basically a heartbeat. And we saw consistent traffic. And this was kind of a cool instant because um, every five minutes, there was a, a port connection to what looked like a random port from what looked like a random IP address. And there were five of those every five minutes. And then every three days, one specific computer would then verify a connection, uh, one of those ports that were found open. It would connect to only the ports that came back with a like Sin, Sinac, Ack handshake. So in that instance, uh, that uh, attacker, the person scanning, took nine months to scan a Class C. So none of the security tools caught this information because it was way beneath the radar. And what we were able to surmise based off that was they were probably using a botnet to do the initial scanning, and then one specific system did uh, the verification scan. So taking that into mind, the bigger the company you are, the bigger the organization, the bigger the attack fund you're probably going to have. The more you're dealing with government, money, politics, more people are going to be attacking you. So it's definitely a good idea to assume that you've probably already been compromised. So what you're looking for is, again, indicators of um, possibly top talkers. If it's an advanced career, they're not going to be top talkers, but you'd be looking for strange data. So you always need defense in depth, constant monitoring. And the more tools you have, unfortunately, sometimes it becomes a little bit more convoluted. But if the tools are set up... Uh, very well, let's say if you have SIMS, uh, security event management tools, uh, or event correlation tools, so you can uh, start correlating the content, uh, sometimes that helps people too. But the only downside of that is some people start to lose the, uh, the ability to see basically what's happening in the weeds. So that's now, where, again, you're doing a lot of work. Yes. Now, Jeremy, question. Um, I know a lot of times we see, you know, organizations taking a long time to identify that there's been a breach or, or what seems like a long time to, um, you know, people maybe not, not in the industry or, or not, uh, not aware of, of what these breaches kind of look like. But why do you think that um, a lot of companies take, you know, 197 days? Do you think that's because of the, the team members that, you know, don't know what they're looking for? Or do you have any thought on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of variables there. I do know that a lot of the organizations I've had uh, an opportunity to work with uh, may not have had the budget uh, to hire enough people to do the proper monitoring. They, they didn't have the training to know what to look for. Um, some organizations just I'm trying to be nice here, but they may not care as much until it happens to them. For example, uh, I'm not sure if anybody here remembers Nortel. But uh, after they had some uh, financial issues, a third party came in and then basically asked the question, why is there so much traffic going to Beijing? And they didn't have any business need for that traffic and come to find out that uh, they'd been compromised for over 10 years and they never knew it until they went out of business. And then a third party came in to look at the data. So sometimes you're looking at content which may look normal and this is where behavioral based and machine learning kind of fails because if you already quote unquote trust the traffic and trust that environment that's going to benchmark what's already there so that's sometimes how they get uh, missed but then other times it could be uh, it's just so slow or it looks like normal traffic that even a, a seasoned professional that looks for that on a daily basis misses it because it looks normal Sure, definitely uh, true with the with the thought that hackers and 
And, um, you know, bad people online are, are getting quite a bit smarter and realizing what these people are looking for and then, you know, doing the opposite of that. Oh, absolutely. And that ties in with here, the quality of the data is huge. Because um, there's a term that a lot of people use, garbage in, garbage out. And if you don't have a, a truly um, good idea of what the network is supposed to be, then that, that, that drastically minimizes the ability to catch it. So uh, I know we did talk about tools a little bit. Um, the primary thing comes down to, again, knowing the data. Uh, for example, I know the term ICS, IoT, and SCADA get thrown around quite a bit, and they should. Um, ICS, industrial control systems and SCADA, uh, those are interesting environments because they're very controlled. And so an environment like that should be a lot easier to catch something that is outside of ordinary rather than an enterprise network when unfortunately you have so many people, uh, their traffic is just going to be what almost seems random in some cases. For example, uh, let's say a football game or uh, some sports event or something actually happens on the news, chances are there's going to be more traffic, people looking it up through Google, um, watching video, which may or may not be corporate policy issue. But just the randomization of regular normal traffic uh, does add some challenge. But if it's a closed environment, that makes things a lot easier, assuming that you have the resources and tools to monitor for changes. So as far as the hunter, absolutely. Um, you're looking at, think of this as more of an analyst role rather than in any sort of engineer role. So you're looking for a pattern and trying to prove and disprove a pattern. So think of it like uh, any, like call homes. I know that a lot of the APTs over the years have been using DNS traffic for uh, exfiltrating information or infiltrating their malware, things in that area. For example, there's a commercial tool out there, if anybody's ever heard of it or used it, uh, called Cobalt Strike. Cobalt Strike uh, is basically the commercial version of Armitage, which used to be an um, interface into um, some other tools, including uh, a Metasploit. But with Cobalt Strike, one of the things it does is it has a mimicking capability for APTs. One is actual DNS traffic. So not just using port 53, but using actual DNS queries to get information in and out or using HTTPS. So basically the hunter, you're trying to identify what shouldn't be there. What's one of these things is uh, not like the other. So that's a, a huge skill that needs to be uh, basically built in. So it's the analyst skill. Sure. Um, so before we move on to the simple threat hunting process, so Jeremy will kind of go over this with us. Just want to remind everyone that um, feel free to ask us, you know, questions in the in the panel here. You don't always get the chance to to ask your questions to an expert like Jeremy. So feel free to pass those on to us. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So one way to look at this too, especially if anybody here has any forensic background, uh, there's instant response, computer forensics, but it all comes down to collecting the data. Um, the other thing though is, is you need some sort of scope, what to look for. So we were talking before about um, trying to identify uh, anything that doesn't fit in. At that point, again, you're looking at it from a forensic standpoint of to prove or disprove a theory. Why doesn't it fit in? Where did it come from? So that's where you establish hypothesis. And then you, uh, during the hunt process is you're trying to prove it. So prove or disprove that theory. Once you're able to identify that it is or is not an actual risk or threat, that's when you go to the actual response phase. But going back to the identification, that's where it all comes down to, uh, you might have to put stuff in a lab to try to reproduce certain types of traffic. And this is also where, um, if you're able to identify a specific, let's say, process calling back to a, a site that you shouldn't be calling back to, you might be able to pull that process out in kind of the a response side, put it into a, a virtual environment, and then see if it's acting the same way. So just think of the, the threat hunting process as kind of a forensics mindset. So when creating the hypothesis, Experience helps a lot. So if you've seen certain types of activity before, you can absolutely 
use that as part of what you believe is actually or could be happening. So I know here you're saying many results uh, and alerts and log entries can be prioritized. Uh, I know with like Sims, uh, usually just a dashboard of a bunch of different events, a lot of people call those top talkers. So they'll basically prioritize certain events that are either the most of those events or the most dangerous, critical of those type of events, which could be something like a port scan. Port scan is usually pretty low on the totem pole. But if that port scan or the IP address it's scanning is seen anywhere further on the network, then that might jump up quite a bit. But the thing is, you actually, if you're monitoring, you have to have somebody looking at the logs. This is also where, unfortunately, a lot of organizations do not have enough resources. Um, they fail because they would have, let's say, um, a team dedicated to intrusion detection uh, monitoring. But then the uh, team members get tasked for other things too. So they may not be able to monitor 24-7. Uh, or even at that aspect, they don't have the team to actually work 24 hours a day. So it might only be an eight to five job. So Jeremy, I'll interrupt you real quick. Talking about that team. Um, so this is obviously one of the you know, most important teams in an organization that ha that collects a lot of data. But besides these, you know, these cybersecurity and, and IT skills that we're kind of talking about, what else have you seen that really makes a successful um, threat hunting team or, or blue team in an organization? Oh, that's a great question. And to be quite honest, uh, communication. One of the biggest things that a lot of very good teams I've seen in the past have had a difficulty with would be able to talk about what they've found into layman's terms for management. So management can actually make a, a, a good decision based off of the findings. So report writing, being able to communicate uh, in a meeting or, or however, uh, just, you know, and also an educator. So if management doesn't see that as a threat, educate them to the threat, but then also know when to, I don't know how other ways to say it, but back off. So if management decides to accept the risk after you've let them know about the risk, then they've accepted it. So then go to the next risk. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, that's helpful, I think, for people looking to, you know, join this team and, and kind of thinking about not just the, the job skills, but also the, you know, the personality and behavior skills that you want to think about as well. Yeah, that can definitely... Uh, make things a little bit easier for you. So next let's move on to, you know, what are we hunting for um, on the blue team? Hey, so some of the biggest types of threats you're dealing with, of course, uh, the bad guys, uh, worst case there an advanced persistent threat. Um, I guess even worst case there after that would be internal employees. So the easy way to think about it is a disgruntled employee can be worse than any other threat based off of they could have the same skill sets as the worst outsider. They also have physical and internal access and they have a trust level. So things which you're looking for, like your indicator of compromise, what kind of things would red flag? So something's already happened and you're trying to identify certain things. For example, if you have um, whitelisting capability for all your applications or certain data, and if a certain program runs on a system that shouldn't be run on, that in itself would be a red flag or indicator of compromise. Uh, things like indicator of attacks. Again, here, understanding the attacks in progress, such as how they're communicating. Is it through a file share or is it through uh, HTTPS, encrypted, HTTP? Um, would somebody be potentially uh, breaking an air gap? Um, worst case scenario, you might have it to where you might be in an organization that is actually air gapped, but you're still exfiltrating data. And I've seen some in very interesting research and actual tools in the past were being for example, like a CCTV would be vulnerable to an IR camera to where you can basically uh, infiltrate or exfiltrate data based off their CCTV system. Or one was a DNA sequencer. Somebody actually put malware into the DNA. Um, sequencer and then it had it read and then exploit the system, which then dropped a rat onto it. Uh, so going back to things that try to think about how the attacker could possibly do it. If it's air gapped, you're not hundred percent 
safe or secure. But those are the type of things you're looking for is something that's outside the pattern and things that aren't trusted. Like you were mentioning network-based artifacts, going to bad domains. That's a very common one that a lot of people will use. They'll uh, look for blacklisted uh, domain names. Um, but if you're, for example, uh, you've banned FTP, if FTP traffic's being seen on the network, that should also definitely red flag. It's going to, the primary thing you're looking for is anything that would is going outside the bounds of what you trust in the environment. And like with host-based, registry keys are huge. Uh, a lot of malware will try to bind themselves because that's an easy way to get it to when the system reboots. It can resurrect the application. If it's member resident, that's another potential issue. But what's interesting about most malware, yes, there's a lot of member resident malware out there, but a lot of malware or most malware will try to run, especially if it's uh, targeting a Windows box, because they know these things are going to reboot. And unless they have something in place to re-exploit that system as soon as it reboots, there's probably going to be some sort of artifact. Or even if it is member resident only, the page file.sys might have remnants of the malware. So that's basically what you're looking for is anything that, again, goes out, outside the bounds of the normal pattern. It's all pattern analysis. So interesting question that kind of came through the chat. Um, do you see hunters specializing in different areas? Uh, so maybe, you know, on a large team, would there be people on the team looking just for network-based artifacts or looking just for host-based artifacts? Do, do people kind of specialize in, in certain things or, or do you see kind of a general, um, more so, of a general, you know, practice on that? Well, absolutely. Specialization is very common. So it's good to know a little bit about uh, what your colleagues are doing, especially in case they get stuck on another case or if for whatever reason they leave the organization. So there's still some cross, uh, I guess, training cross um, uh, skill set, but absolutely specialization is actually a good thing to have to, to an extent. Because uh, network, there might be somebody who's extremely good at network, but uh, they may not know some of the tools for uh, doing data carving on a hard drive. So yes, um, specialization is good. Um, it's always good to know everything, but you can't know everything. Sure. Sure. So think of, I'm assuming a lot of people here have probably heard of the CMM uh, capability maturity model. Uh, this is basically taken from that. Uh, which is basically a threat hunting maturity model and where you are as an organization based off of how or the capability that you have to identify threats. So I know here they have a zero initial, relies on automated alerting. So you have little to no routine data collection. And if you're not collecting data, that's kind of a, it makes things more difficult. <laughs> so with one, they have a minimal, you have uh, some indicator searches, but you also have um, moderate or high level of routine data collection. So things even sub like uh, NetFlow and SFlow, that's just basically the metadata of the network traffic. Um, so you're looking at uh, ports, uh, times, uh, basically the, the communications between two systems without the payload. But at least you can uh, correlate some of the content. Procedural, Follows data analysis procedures created by others, um, high and very high level of routine data collection. So um, this is where, again, server logs, it becomes a lot more uh, consistent. And then three, again, very high level, but creates new analysis procedures. So this is where it kind of gets really interesting. Going back to things like the traditional policies, standards, and procedures. This is where you would have not only timed uh, changes, but you'd also have event-driven changes. So when you're creating your own, creating your uh, new analysis, when you see something strange, uh, your team may create a new IDS uh, signature to look for certain types of traffic. Um, if a system's online that's, uh, let's say, beaconing back home or it looks or it tripped above overflow, um, then you would put that into like a quarantine. So you're constantly changing things to try to identify threats. And then for leading, 
automates the majority of the data analysis procedures. So same basic principle, where you might also have things like more intelligent IPSs in line. But it's constantly managed. That's the trick, is not only you're creating new procedures, um, you're testing and validating them, but um, this is where SIMs also come in. But primary thing is the testing and validation, and it's constant at level four. Uh, so with that, right before we get to some more of the questions that we've got, I uh, just wanted to talk briefly about um, InfoSec Institute's cyber threat hunting course. Um, so in our course, what you'll do is you'll learn to identify, hunt down, and analyze um, these cyber threats that we went over today. And it'll focus a lot on that maturity model that Jeremy just talked us through. Um, so you'll be learning how to measure your organization's threat hunting capabilities and you know, finding solutions on um, how, to, how to better that. You'll also build an effective threat hunting solution based on open source tools and you'll have the opportunity to take the exam to become a certified cyber threat hunting professional. Um, so, you know, of course, with that certification, you can prove to employers and you know recruiters that you have the skills needed to uh, to do this job um, one cool thing we have going on and I know Jeremy you have some of these uh, some of these tools, tools here, here. Um, but these are ethical hacking toys and we will be giving away some of these with um, course enrollments until the end of the year Jeremy could you tell us briefly what some of these are so uh, a couple of ones that I do like quite a bit. Um, so you have your Tetra, which is that wireless uh, access point to the mid um, icon. That is a very good utility to basically put in line to test the security of your wireless and also the security of your clients because it'll broadcast any access point that uh, the clients are ever connected to and have trusted and then pretend to be them automatically. So you can do all this stuff on your own, but this automates the process and saves a lot of time. And then of course the USB thumb drives, those actually are not thumb drives, those are gonna be rubber duckies. So they look like a thumb drive, but they act as a generic keyboard. So this bypasses most of the USB security out there. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, good utilities on there. Sure, some some cool stuff to to play with to get some hands-on experience with, um, with the jobs. So, moving on from those, um, let's take some of the questions that we got. So, starting out, um, I think of an interesting question here. So, since this is a newer role, um, you know, blue team threat hunting hasn't been around for all that long. Uh, if if you'd agree to that, Jeremy. Um, but who do you see transition into this role? You know, what kind of job titles have you seen um, move into this role and with what certifications or what background uh, have you seen successful, successful transitions with? Oh, man. Um, I've seen people with, for example, an Intel background, uh, which are good analysts, uh, pen testers, uh, people that have, for example, a basic uh, cert team capability or forensics capability move into this. And it is relatively new, but realistically, uh, think of it as more of an active incident response team rather than your traditional reactive. But as far as uh, size of companies, um, definitely larger companies are trying to get into this because they're trying to minimize their risk. Um, medium-sized companies, I have seen some of the smaller, not as much based off of budget. And, the, um, and they're usually reactive if they have any security capability at all. Sure. So the large. Um, so when, when do you think it'd be the right time for a company to transition into a little bit more of um, a mature cyber threat hunting, you know, is there a size of the company or does it depend on what, what data your company has or, or what do you think, um, you know, Honestly, what type of companies should be really concerned with this? If they care about their security, any of those companies, uh, primarily because you're going from reactive to proactive and that makes 100% of the difference. So yeah, if you actually care about getting compromised, I would as a company I would push this route. Sure. It saves money in the long run. Right, to be yeah, proactive instead of reactive is definitely definitely a safer bet, I'd say. Yeah. 
Um, we've got a question from AJ. If someone wants to move to security um, from maybe a support type role, where would they start? So some of the basic areas I would definitely start um, knowing networking is huge. So I know some of the certifications do help depending on where you're at. A uh, degree is another way to go. Um, but yeah, certifications like Net Plus, Security Plus, and then target what's that security group needs. That's the biggest thing. I know a lot of or people are saying automatically go to CEH or CHFI or um, a specific route. But if you have a group in mind, see what they're the weakest in or what their biggest need is, focus on that because uh, you're trying to make the team better too. And then you're far more likely to, to get what you want out of it as well. Sure. Are there any particular skills that um, you know, you'd say would be a good, good place to focus on if the goal is to become a threat hunter or kind of in that security team? Yeah, identify anomalies. Um, if you can look at something and identify what's not like the rest, that definitely helps quite a bit. And that's more of a, I guess, a skill you have to, to play with or practice on. Um, but outside that, uh, personally, I've always liked the, uh, the vulnerability identification, exploitation, being able to do a forensic analysis. So I guess depending on what you want to focus on later on, um, go down that route. But uh, primarily, uh, keeping your eye on new threats. So if that means attending conferences like DEF CON or Black Hat, those are also very good. You're always trying to keep ahead of the game. So identify changes and then also keep your eye out for what's on the horizon. Sure. Um, question through the, through the chat here. So this person has an organization with less than 50 staff. Um, what would be your recommended kind of chain of command in terms of security? Um, so they have CISO, ISM, um, et cetera listed, but who would you think would be kind of the, um, kind of the main person that should be in charge of this in a small organization? So in a small company, usually you're looking at uh, the CISO and the CSO or CISO, whatever their title is going to be, should talk directly to the CEO and not the CIO because there's a conflict of or interest if uh, you're dealing directly with the CIO or chief technology officer because their goal is to keep everything up and running online as cheap as possible within budget. And your goal is to fix things. Um, make sure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability is intact. So absolutely, um, a CISO would be the, the best one in a small company. Uh, if it's an extremely large company, then the CISO would have different groups, and then you'd have your ISM. But yeah, CISO. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think that'll, that'll help answer your question, Bernard. Um, so looking at the overall career, because we, we talked about a lot of ways to get into that career. Uh, do you think threat hunting is a growing career um, compared to other cybersecurity roles? Um, so this person is looking to kind of transition into a role with more long-term job security. So do you think threat hunting would be a safe, a safe bet to go? Yes. Uh, and then learning a little bit more uh, of what you like better, for example, reverse engineering, is technically part of the threat hunting that's just a lot more specialized. But yes, um, the easiest way to think about threat hunting, I guess, would be an incident response team that tries to catch things as they're happening and before they happen rather than just react. So yeah, it's definitely going to be huge, especially with all the litigation happening now and leaks. Sounds good. Um, to answer one of the questions in the in the uh, question box, yes, we will send out a recording of this presentation in case you missed anything. Um, another question here is, what um, dev or scripting language or tools are useful for a security role? Anything that's common in the environment. Uh, for example, if you're on Windows, PowerShell is actually extremely powerful. It was probably not a good idea for Microsoft to release that to the public. So I know a lot of attackers are using that um, if it's on the system. Um, there's Python. Uh, I know with, uh, especially Linux and Windows, you might have to add uh, the dependencies on the system. 
So yeah, Windows, yeah, PowerShell, Python, Ruby, but basically whatever is already on the environment and or whatever works best with uh, specifically what you're trying to do. So sure. it's kind of a variable there. Sure, just depending on what the what the organization uh, primarily uses as well, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so another another question, we have time for just a couple more here. So how do you catch traffic on the OT networks for detecting anomalies or specific, or sus excuse me, suspicious traffic? So when doing the traffic analysis, basically what you're dealing with is uh, you'd have to have some sort of aggregators. Uh, for example, in a lot of networks, they are capturing NetFlow S-Flow data. So basically the meta information of all the traffic, you need at least that. Most organizations cannot do full packet capture, either due to legal issues or just storage space, because that's extremely large traffic and expensive. But yeah, you'd have to you put aggregators throughout the network and then look for anomalies. Sure. Um, so we'll do just one or two more here. So thank you to everyone who's submitting questions for us. Um, so. Somebody's asking, in an educational organization without a security team that is attempting to run vulnerability tests in order to stop common malware, what would your advice be as a proper course of action on tools? Um, they currently have used only Kali Linux. Yay. So tools, I guess it, there are a lot of good open source tools out there. Um, I would definitely suggest looking into things like either Snort or Security Onion with um, the capability to monitor. Yeah, you also have OpenVos, which you can absolutely put on Kali. That's a decent vulnerability scanner. But uh, I would definitely suggest on putting out some either Snort or um, Security Onion sensors throughout the network. Good recommendations. I think that'll... Um help you, Gerardo, to look for that in your organization. Um, so let's see, let's just get to, let's try and get to two more here and then we will let, uh, let Jeremy go and wrap up the presentation here. Um, Jeremy, do you have any experience working with anomaly detection algorithms when analyzing logs or network traffic? Um, kind of that PCAPs that we were talking about, I believe. Um, and how would you recommend getting, to, uh, getting a start on machine learning for threat hunting? Any experience there that you could share? Yeah, so I'm working on with a colleague right now. He actually is a data scientist, so that's what he went to college for, and he loves it. Um, we were using a, a TensorFlow as the uh, basically the algorithm that we're messing around with it to try to identify not only uh, potential risks and threats from attackers, but also potential uh, vulnerabilities. So just based off of traffic going back and forth. Um, but at this point, a lot of it is gonna be, I don't wanna say necessarily homegrown because a lot of the vendors are pushing this right now, but it's not as good as it probably should be or could be, sorry, uh, with as much effort has been put into it by the security community. But yeah, TensorFlow and Torch are some pretty good. Perfect. Anyway. and. Um, last question here before we wrap up. I know you kind of said that scripting is a little bit different um, for each organization, but do you have to know scripting to get into this profession? No, but it it's, makes life a lot easier, especially if you're trying to automate things. Um, full blown programming helps even better, but uh, you, you definitely don't need to know scripting, especially depending on what you're gonna wanna get out of it. But if you did wanna go into the deep learning side, some things like that you might actually have to um, pick up a language. Sure, to be a little bit more successful. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, Jeremy, just wanted to, to thank you for joining us today and I wanna thank all the audience. We had some great questions and some great participation. I hope this was you know, useful and informative to everyone. Um, if we didn't get to all the questions, you can go ahead and um, you know, give our team a call if, if they're based on the uh, certification training course that we are um, promoting for this 
for the cyber threat hunting course that we have available to you. Um, so somebody would be happy to, to give you more details on that. And if you're interested in just kind of learning more about that, um, the link is there for you as well as the phone number. And as we wrap up here, um, you know, I hope everyone has a great day and, and especially thanks again to Jeremy for joining us on a great session. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.